mention uh, just a few names to you as if these were read from a court list. And anyone who recognizes any of these names, just put up your hand. Randy Drupin. Thomas Sofano. David Milgard. E. Paul Moran. Donald Marshall. Now these are only a sampling of several more cases which have been documented in Canada in the last 20 years as having gone horribly wrong. <coughs> Each one of these individuals was wrongly convicted. Each one of these individuals was innocent. Now, if we have this number of mistakes made, in murder cases, what's the likelihood we're also having mistakes made in less serious cases that will never justify a public inquiry? Of course, there are going to be many. There's no sense to arguing that only in murder cases are mistakes made. Why are the mistakes made? Because it's a human process. Human beings dealing with human gathered evidence, and drawing inferences and conclusions which turn out to be mistaken. What's the message to be drawn from those cases? Slow down. Be careful. Do it right. Make sure there's full disclosure. Make sure people are properly represented. Don't let the public clamor be a rush to conviction. The point here is the administration of justice which Mr. Owen referred to quite aptly as a centerpiece in a free and democratic society, should be the last thing subject to restraint. It should be the last thing where we reduce funding because we're going to make more mistakes, we're going to create more injustice, even in the best system in the world. around um, prevention and um, if, if Mr. Um, and, and it's going to seem like I'm being incredibly critical of Mr. Cooper. There's a lot in his report that we agree with. This is the nature of lawyers, right? I come up here and I want to make an exciting presentation for you and tell you all the things that I just started. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, back up. There's lots of things we agree with. He, he, uh, he agreed with our presentation that police officers should not be uh, approving charges. That, that should remain with Crown Council and we support that decision 100%. This is critical. Uh, that somebody independent of police be looking at the police file and say, is there enough evidence here to convict someone if it goes to trial? That that, it, that, that process is separated. When we look at provinces where that doesn't exist, uh, there's a significant uh, portion of cases that are stayed after someone's been charged, and of course the consequences for someone having to go to trial and these kinds of things are very serious. And also a much lower percentage of successful prosecutions that end in a guilty, uh, either guilty plea or a guilty finding by a judge. And so uh, we agree 100% with that. And also, uh, if the report had been called, you know, a number of administrative suggestions that we have for criminal justice branch to, to make things a little bit easier and more efficient, um, then sure. But the report is called, uh, importantly, a criminal justice system for the 21st century. And from our organizational perspective, a criminal justice system for the 21st century uh, needs to really emphasize the question of how are people ending up in our prisons? This, should, this is the most important question. Who is in prison? How did they get there? Why are they not getting out of prison? So when uh, Mr. Cowper found, and this is a remarkable statistic, 41% of the offenses that provincial court deals with are so-called administrative uh, administration of justice offenses. That means that someone's not keeping their conditions when they're released from court, uh, and they're told, okay, don't go to this neighborhood, don't talk to this person, stay sober, attend a treatment facility, these kinds of things. When you breach those, you're charged again with a breach offense. This is an example of an administration of justice offense. 41% are people breaching their conditions when they're waiting for trial. And so you could get rid of 41%, theoretically, you could get rid of 41% of the caseload, or up close to, you'll never get rid of it entirely. A significant proportion of what the provincial court deals with by dealing with that, but why is it so high? Well, 20, the police say that 29% of the people that they deal with are mentally ill. 
They have serious addictions. Their prisons have become warehouses for the mentally ill. The federal correctional investigator says the same thing about federal prisons. So we're loading all of these mentally ill people into this system that is so ill-suited for them. There are no treatment options in the prisons because the budget's been cut so dramatically. Uh, and in terms of uh, the initiatives that have tried to deal with the systemic issue, the community, community court initiative uh, is one that was lauded by the provincial government. Uh, this is an experimental court in Vancouver that was supposed to look at the core reasons. Why is somebody committing offenses? Are they not on welfare? Do they not have housing? Do they have an addiction issue, a mental health issue that we can deal with outside the criminal justice system has failed. It's failed to provide people with housing other than emergency shelters. People have more court appearances in community court uh, than they have in regular court. And the, one of the goals was to reduce the number of appearances. The main success of the community court has been in uh, getting volunteer labor for local businesses because people are sentenced to do community service work for local businesses. But it hasn't been able to deal with these core issues, and it's not any fault of the court or the intention or anything else, is that the services don't exist. You can't send someone to drug treatment that doesn't exist. You can't send someone to housing that doesn't exist. You can't send someone to mental health services that don't exist. And the important context of my remarks to remember is that Mr. Cowper was asked to do something very specific, which was to talk about the administration of the justice system. But I was asked to come here to talk about the BC Civil Liberties Association perspective of the justice system for the 21st century. And from our organization's perspective, due process is critically important um, in terms of it, it is the most important that the justice system is an essential service and should be funded accordingly, that it's not a business, and that applying uh, business models to the criminal justice system will result in rights violations. Even out of the best intentions, we have to be so cautious about that. And the second part is that the best criminal justice system is one that is aimed at preventing people from being in the criminal justice system at all, because it is the most powerful most extreme uh, representation of state power, police, uh, prisons, uh, total loss of liberty. And that that is what we should be focusing all of our efforts on. And I note uh, that police have seen a 30% increase in funding at the time when uh, the justice system itself as a whole has seen 30 40% uh, reductions. And that statistic comes from Mr. Cowper's report as well. So a lot of really helpful information in there about what's going on um, in terms of uh, some of the issues that our organization sees that need to be addressed. And I, I just wanted to say one last piece is that Mr. Cowper and I had the, the unique opportunity to work on the Frank Paul inquiry. This was an inquiry around a almost Aboriginal man, a chronic alcoholic, who was picked up by police uh, at least once a day, sometimes twice a day, caused a huge amount of cost to the criminal justice system, the emergency response system. And uh, uh, Commissioner Davies, who heard the public inquiry around Frank Paul's death, um, which was incredibly tragic and related to um, very poor decisions made by the police, uh, made a very important recommendation about sobering centers and the idea of removing uh, chronic alcoholics and people who have overdosed on drugs from the custody of police, people arrested for public intoxication, because uh, police are very ill-suited for that task. And uh, it's our organization's opinion that it's not just chronic alcoholics and sobering centers, it's also people with mental health issues and people with crack addictions and people with crystal meth addictions and people with heroin addictions addictions and so on, and that if we are going to make the justice system for the 21st century, that we really have to um, address uh, this cohort, and we would save a huge amount of uh, not just resources, but also uh, misery, frankly, uh, that comes from our justice system as it's currently implemented. Um, so those are my remarks, and, uh, and again, uh, thank you uh, to Mr. Calvert for doing this report and for raising these issues and giving us a chance to talk about these things, uh, because without his report, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today, so I, I'm hugely appreciative for that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now, I'm looking at a, a group of dedicated and intelligent, experienced, and thoughtful people right now. But every day that I go to the courthouse, and this has happened in all the years that have given me uh, these gray hairs, is that when you, when you look at the gallery in the remand court, if you just walk in, instead of looking at the judge, you look around at the people who are sitting in the rows waiting for their case to be called, you know what you see there? You see despair, despondency, poverty, mental illness, addiction, 
and stress. That's what you see. Many of the people who get drawn into the criminal justice system are already disadvantaged. If we don't handle them with care and restraint in the criminal justice system, all we have done is damage them more. That's all we have done. Made them less likely to be hired as an employee. Make them less likely to be a, a welcome tenant in the apartment block. Made them less likely to have friends and associates and neighbors who would be proud to associate with them. We've set them back even more. That's not a, a point that we should never prosecute. The point is we should do it with restraint. Do it with restraint. What most of those individuals that I'm referring to need is a friend, a job, a social worker, a mental health worker. Most of them, that's what they need, of the large group. And for many of those individuals that I'm referring to, they are deemed ineligible for legal aid because they're not facing imprisonment or they're not facing loss of employment, two of the main criteria for the granting of legal aid. But they're suffering all the other consequences of being prosecuted. So one of the things that we should be doing is every one of the individuals who's drawn into that expensive, blunt machinery that is the criminal justice system, if they are poor, they should have counsel immediately. They need an advocate. They need someone to advocate why the system ought not to continue, or if it is going to continue, to do it in a sophisticated way. Now, one of the very commendable features of Mr. Cowper's report is that he recognized, and I say validated, something that heretofore was well known by those who are in the system, but not well spoken of or spoken of at a high profile. And that's the notion of pre-charge resolution. That is resolving cases without a charge being laid. What an excellent idea. But it takes an advocate. Somebody who's going to take the time to know the individual, gather the information, and make the case for the case being diverted from the criminal justice system. So one of the things that should happen is we should immediately ensure that people who are considered worthy of being prosecuted or who must be prosecuted, we ought to provide them with counsel if they're poor and not limited to only those who are supposedly facing imprisonment. Mr. Cowper's report also validated notions of diversion and alternative measures. Those are excellent ideas because they allow for addressing the problems without causing the harm. Now, it's just a coincidence today that when I came back to the office after being out of town on a case, part of my mail was an invitation from the Victoria Restorative Justice Society, an evening of decadent desserts. <laughs> this is an effort for the Restorative Justice Society to raise money to operate one of the best programs that is out there. Something designed to restore the damage caused by a crime, if that's what occurred, without the harm, and to reconcile the offender with not only the individual who may have been harmed, but the community. But they must resort to having a dessert program to raise money for, the, for their program. This should be funded. It should be funded to the greatest extent possible. Why is that? Because not only would we save individuals from the harm that's caused from being drawn into the criminal justice system, but we would also help people turn a corner and be positive contributors to, this, to the system. Help re restore them to our neighborhood and our community. So I return to my initial message. Fund it properly, use it with restraint, and be very careful about how you do it. So. So let me, let me do a contrast here because I do think there's a crisis and I think the IRP, and I may not have, uh, David said he, I held it up as an example, but I think it's a very cautionary tale. So, so you have essentially drunken driving in the province of British Columbia. You have essentially the, 
the level of drunken driving drops with the innovation of 08, the invention of the breathalyzer or generation ago, and it drops significantly. So we did start to have success at lowering the level of drunken driving and the lowering the level of deaths on the highways in British Columbia. But it basically leveled off for basically 25 years. It didn't go down. Okay? And in the same time period, an impaired charge went from being a half-day trial to being a three- or four-day trial. They went from being heard in a couple of months to being heard in a couple of years. And they went to, from being relatively straightforward to going through, and this isn't my specialty, but I can tell you, waves of various defenses based on technical issues related to breathalyzer, charter issues, and the like, until they occupied maybe as much as 30%, we don't have an exact number, 30% of the trial days in the provincial court, with no decline in the deaths on the highways. And where David and I, I'm sure we agree with, other, with each other on this, but ultimately what we care about there is that the, David said that he's concerned about IRP is concerned about the process associated with it, and I know he and I are both concerned about people dying on the highways. Okay? Now, the IRP comes in, it's a civil system, instantly, within days of that system coming in, there's a 40% decline in fatalities on the roadways. 40% decline. So 40 lives, roughly 100 people, 40 lives were saved as a result of the system. Now, you can also make it more practical in the sense that what the IRP exploits is what the criminal justice system originally believed in, which is a, a, you know, proportionate sanctions immediately delivered. So what happens is you're stopped, you blow over a weight, and the first thing is you lose your truck. Okay, and I grew up in southern Alberta. Losing your truck is a big deal, right? It's a very big deal, right? Because you can't get around, you can't, you know, your wife asks you where the truck is, and when you came back from the pub the night before, and you can't say, well, you know, some stupid cop dug I haven't got the truck. Your, 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 your workmates won't lend you their trucks because they want to know where your truck is, and they, they might think you had a, drive, a suspended uh, driver's license. And so it's a sanction that's immediately applied, and the studies have demonstrated that it has far more effect on the future drunken driving behavior of those people than the 08 system had. Now, I can tell you that we could sit there and we could all agree on what the ideal criminal justice approach to drunk driving is, but we will never get a government of any strike to go back to the 08 system if that is going to drive safety on the highways. Because ultimately, we don't care that much about people losing their trucks. They're not going to jail. They're losing their trucks. They're losing their driving privileges. They have to go to courses on, on not driving, dr drinking and driving. To me, the crisis is we have to, within the court system, provide both fairness fair process, proportional process, and results to society. And, I, I, and I'm mindful of the time, so let me, let me sort of wrap up and talk about a couple of things that uh, Robert talked about. Um, and I agree with, uh, with much of what he said. Uh, one thing I think we, we are, we're on opposite sides of the debate on is, is my note is that Robert said we need to slow down and be careful. Well, my report says we have to be timely. That doesn't mean that you start a murder trial seven days after you know, the, the body's cooling down. It means that you have to be timely in relation to the type of case it is. When I wandered around the province, the, the province, it's a great privilege to do so, I met hardly anybody, anybody, lawyers, defense counsel, prosecutors, and there's someone that, uh, I have met hardly anybody who said, you know what, we're delivering timely justice. I mean, sometimes it was, anger, sometimes it was sort of guilt, sometimes it was sort of inevitable, well, that's the way the system works. But nobody thought we were doing things on a timely basis. And so I challenged everybody to think about what would the public expect to be timely. Because I can tell you, when you ask the public, they have a totally different metric in mind for timeliness. The idea that you could have a relatively minor criminal matter set for trial a year away, a well-informed, reasonable person in the public goes, that's just way too long. That just doesn't make any sense. And I actually think the more they learn about it, the less in favor they are of that kind of delay. So I'm not in favor of slowing down. I think we've slowed down well. Uh, as lawyers, slowing down is some, one of our core skills, actually. Um, slowing down is something we learn in first year law. It's not an advanced course. It's the first, first year course that we take. Uh, I think the advanced course has to be uh, getting to a timely way. Um, 
I will say this about the um, the wrongful conviction cases is the thing I, I've been fascinated with them for 20 years now, and and the thing that I think is fascinating about them is that very few of them were the product of speed. I don't know if any of them were the product of speed. What's fascinating about them is how they're the product of biases, of poor procedures, of poor management of the police. Okay, many of them are the result of the prosecutors or the police becoming focused on, like Deep Paul Moran would be an example. They focused on him and they, and they lost the detective instinct. They lost the instinct to look at all the evidence and see what other suspects were out there. Many of those would be the same example. Milgard might be another example of that. Marshall would be another example of that. Whereas a result of the lack of discipline, a lack of systematization, standardization, a lack of real professional discipline, the system went wrong. And so I actually, I think we need more professional discipline, more systemization. We need to learn from those examples. And, and speed is not the, the uh, primary characteristic. And going slower does not mean we're not going to convict the wrongfully convicted. What, what will need to happen is we need to learn more lessons for the substantive learning uh, from each of those cases. We're in BC today. Some of our major cases have been rolling through the Supreme Court for years and have not a trial date set. As of today, we have two or three of the most major criminal cases have been before the courts for years, and we don't have a trial date set. I think ultimately, the public's going to say that's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable to have major criminal murder cases forget, you know, happening too quickly, just never seeing to go to trial. Eventually, we're going to have a real crisis in our hands because some of these major cases are going to collapse, and then the public's going to say, hold on a second, we trusted you with that most sacred task, which is to try people fairly in accordance with the rule of law, and you let us down. And I'm convinced that it, as a result of the developments I started talking about at the beginning, I actually think we're in an incredibly exciting time because I think we have the lessons at hand, we have disciplines at hand, we have, I think, the will at hand, and frankly, the fact that we are in a very financially straightened time may give us the incentive to actually make the system work better than it's ever worked before. And, and I agree with Robert, we have one of the best systems in the world, but there's a lot that can be improved. And I hope I've provided some ideas that would improve. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for three uh, incredibly intelligent, uh, experience-based, articulately presented um, series of, of ideas for the criminal justice system. And of course, concentrating on, on just report. Um, let me just make one comment on what we've heard here tonight, and that is with respect to the prison system. Um, strangely, um, <coughs> morosely, if you are in a Canadian prison today uh, for any kind of a serious car charge that has you there for some period of time, um, it's supposed to be, you would think, the most secure place in Canada. But isn't that the idea? We want things secure especially from people getting out, but for people in that system, you're the most um, likely to be assaulted, uh, infected, and addicted as a group in Canadian society. Those three calamities are more likely to fall upon you. And then take a step back and think about, and we've heard a bit about this tonight, who that population is. Uh, there was a tremendous community living uh, process and uh, series of discussions uh, led by a, a person named Al Admansky in the mid to late 80s uh, in his Society for Community Justice and it was it went right to the heart of this issue of who's in jail and overwhelmingly people in jail were people suffering mental illness and also in, a, in this climate of, of danger and the whole idea of community living was to uh, let's put people into the community, into group houses where they got some rehabilitation, they learned some skills, they got reintroduced into society, and they weren't subject to the terrible ills that happened in prisons all too often. Well, that was great. And the British Columbia government, in all its wisdom, uh, closed uh, Essendale and closed Woodlands, these uh, mental health <laughs> facilities. And what happened to a lot of those people who were residents and re actually receiving some care? Uh, they went into the community. Um, we saved money on the, on the mentally ill hospitals, but we didn't spend it in the community. We broke faith. So people uh, with mental illnesses 
we're out in the community, unsupervised, without support. <coughs> what happens in Vancouver? They drifted down to the downtown east side, and they got assaulted, infected, um, and addicted. And then they ended up in the criminal justice system, uh, it, where they should, they should never have been in the first place. So just a cautionary tale, and mentioning Ted is to remind us not only of his uh, contribution to Canadian society and this whole question, um, but to remind us that these things come up again and again. And, you know, we tried in the 70s, we tried in the 80s, we tried in the 90s, we've got a brilliant report now, and I think every one of us in this room has a responsibility to read that report carefully and exert whatever influence they may have in their society and in the public policy of our communities to make sure those recommendations are followed. I agree with Bob about 99% of the time. The one place where I don't quite agree is that we have the best system in the world. Given the values that you've expressed tonight and I've heard over the years, I would say that the Scandinavian countries do better, that South Australia does better, that Fiji does better in a strange way, that France does better. But in general, the adversary systems have been a disadvantage that you get less justice in adversarial systems than you in inquisitorial systems. My job was to be sure that the truth came out and said, in your society, I understand that you have two lawyers who fight and twist a little bit, each trying to win. Aren't you interested in truth? And that bothered me. That's what I had an epiphany. Does our system work for truth? So I basically, I would say that I like what you have to say about what we should be doing, but I just say that there are other places, non-North American systems, non-English systems, that do it best. Just two brief comments. Uh, first of all, thank you for the intervention. 90% of what you said was really good. <laughs> I am a strong defender of the adversary system, and I tell you why, because it allows for the challenging that sometimes does not go on in the inquisitorial system. The second point is a criminal trial, in my philosophy, and one that's shared in Canada and other countries like ours, uh, needs to be clearly understood. A criminal trial is not a public inquiry into the truth. It is not a commission into the truth. The true nature of a criminal trial reflecting individual liberty, which is a fundamental value in, in Canada, is a criminal trial is really the prosecution is on trial. It's not the accused that's on trial. The nature of a criminal trial when it's properly understood is this. The Crown indicts Jack or Jane for an alleged offense. The whole trial is about whether or not the prosecution can prove what they accuse Jack or Jane of. And if they fail, they are entitled to the, retain the presumption of innocence and go free. That's our reflection of the importance of the individual. So please don't think of a criminal trial as being an inquiry into the truth. That's not what it is. It's an inquiry into whether or not the prosecution can prove, with legally admissible evidence, what they charged. That's the nature of it.